Okay, thank you very much <coughs> for that very kind introduction. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm sorry that I cannot speak the local tongue, and you must bear over with my somewhat limited English. Uh, but I try to uh, see if it's possible to <coughs> to explain uh, what I really to explain what what this has been all about. So I will talk some about some experiences from developing a drug-free treatment program. Uh, in northern Norway, uh, and I will say that first of all, I will talk a little about the Norwegian context, then why, then the mandate, and then how we've choose, chosen to organize, and then the medication-free program, and uh, maybe a little about what we have achieved. And first of all, I would like to say that the drug-free treatment program is firstly, uh, or mostly, a possibility for persons with serious mental problems to choose treatment that does not include antipsychotics, or rather neuroleptics, which more addresses, you know, the function of this kind of medication. Uh, neuroleptics don't really work on psychosis, they work on the brain. And they work similarly on the brains to people without mental disorders as to, on people with mental disorders. So it's basically a question for us, for people to have a choice, to be able to choose something that doesn't include drugs. We don't have a very active anti-drug policy. Some people might feel that they need drugs and they want to use drugs, but they should have the possibility to choose. And that's one of the main ideas about this. So then a little about the Norwegian context. You see Norway here and the arrow towards uh, Tromsø, which is far north, uh, far north of the, some 500 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, and I would like, first of all, and this I haven't done that for a long time, but I think these days it's, impos it's important to point to the fact that Norway is a democracy. And I think that's uh, one of the reasons that this development has been possible. And there are many different uh, traits to what a democracy is. <laughs> and um, uh, I think that, you know, the, the idea that it, equality is better for everyone is a very central part of a real democracy. And that's uh, one of the reasons why it's been possible to develop this within the Norwegian context. <clears throat> there are, has for a long time been two central messages for the development of healthcare in Norway. The one is that we should have the patient's healthcare system. Some professionals used to think that we should have, you know, the professional's healthcare system, but now it's the patient's healthcare system, both in organizing and in clinical work. And like the health, the Secretary of Health said back in 2015, the basic question is, if the patients were given the right to decide, how would we organize and run the healthcare system? This is a radical question. The answer we get should be taken seriously, and it should be decisive for the work with the patient's healthcare system. So that is one important drive for this development. And another important drive is the golden rule, which uh, you might know as the law of reciprocity in many religions, you know, the principle that you should treat others as, as you would like to be treated yourself. But in Norway, if you ask people what the golden rule is, they would generally say, well, treatment programs in mental health and substance abuse shall have a higher yearly growth than programs in somatic medicine. And that goes for many different things, both number of employees, waiting time, number of patient consultations, and economic growth. <clears throat> so, Norwegian health, mental health is, uh, as the rest of the healthcare system in Norway, basically a public system where we have a very strong emphasis on primary healthcare with general practitioners and also other people involved. And we have specialized healthcare, which is organized on a state level, while the local system is organized on a local level and financed on the local level. And the specialized healthcare is organized in four regional health trusts. Uh, and in uh, mental health, we both have psychiatric hospitals and local psychiatric centers as part of the specialized healthcare in the regions. So here you see the four different the regions, healthcare regions in Norway, and the University Hospital of North Norway is central in the northern region. And in mental health, we have the responsibility for 
some regional sponsor responsibility, some local responsibility, and, so, and we're also a psychiatric hospital for the, the, close, the local part of the, of the region and also some other parts. So there are different catchment areas for different parts of the hospital, actually. Uh, the state runs the different parts of the healthcare system in Norway by issuing what you can call regulatory documents every year, where they tell the different regional health trusts what they should focus on. <clears throat> so they send it to the regional health trust, and the health trust will send it to the hospital, and the hospital will send it to the division. So this is how, uh, you know, we are told what we should do in this uh, trust-based system. And so, why medication-free treatment in this system? Well, <clears throat> the thing is that there has for a long time been talk about uh, the possibility of treating mental health problems without drugs in Norway. And some user organization argued very strongly for this, but the government would say, well, the user organizations, they don't agree. So, we really don't know what to do. But then, five of the user organizations united, and I think that's a very important story. It's very important to be able for the user organizations to cooperate, to move forward. And that's a big story. You should probably invite someone from what's now called the Joint Action for Drug-Free Treatment Programs in Mental Health, which is uh, five user organizations in Norway that has joined forces to achieve this possibility. So that's been a very important part of the development. <clears throat> so the, the regulatory document, since they established this joint forces in the, this joint uh, uh, initiative back in 2010, immediately they got the Ministry of Healthcare to include this in the regulatory document, where they said that patients in need of psychiatric help shall, within prudent frames of treatment, have the choice of different treatment options. Amongst these, treatment options that do not include the use of medication. So this was a very strong message to the different parts of the regional healthcare, but still, the regional healthcare didn't find resources or possibilities to do anything about this. So this was not given priority at all within the healthcare system. So the joint action kept, you know, telling the ministry that, well, you have to, you have to be sure that this, is mo this moves forward within the regional health trust. So in 2015, uh, the health ministry wrote a letter, a special letter to the regional health trust telling them that each regional trust shall establish alternatives to medication, including help to tapering and termination of the use of medication and help to establish other therapeutic treatment measures. And for patients that are admitted to psychiatric treatment facilities and that are being treated with medication, there should be made plans for tapering and termination of the treatment with drugs. And also to obtain experience with medication-free treatment of patients with serious mental problems, each regional health trust must establish at least one bed unit reserved for this purpose. So this was a very strong message and that it got a very short time limit to implement this uh, from the Ministry of Health in Norway. And they should, according to the Ministry, make a regional plan. The, health, uh, the regional health trust should make a plan together with representatives from the user organizations and ensure a proposal for a unified solution that is written down in a protocol and signed by both parties that is the health trust and the affected user organizations. So we have never before seen any, anywhere that the user organizations have gotten such a big influence on the uh, uh, establishment of a new possibility in the treatment system. This was something very new because they were included in the planning process on an equal basis. And the government said that, well, when you agree, then you have fulfilled your obligations. That's what they told the regional health trusts. So this was a very strong message, uh, which was very special in Norway. <clears throat> so all parties treated with, uh, with medications should have plans for tapering to obtain experience, establish a, drug, uh, a unit, and include user knowledge in the planning process. So these three things were very central in this process. 
So we had the, there was developed a regional plan, and uh, due to this regional plan, we developed this, the um, so-called drug-free unit in Tromsø. And the regional plan, the mandate that was that came out of the regional plan, that was we should, uh, <clears throat> the drug-free program shall be established at the University Hospital Northern Norway. One of the reasons for that was because no one else wanted it. And we said that, well, we will do this. <clears throat> the hospital shall give priority to the development of a bed unit with six beds, and the drug-free program shall have regional responsibility. That means that we should have responsibility for the whole region, which is a rather big region. <clears throat> uh, and the drug-free treatment, they, they had this protocol that stated a lot of things, and now, although it's a lot of text here, I will have to present that for you so that that is clear. It should secure choice. It's a part of a major effort to reduce the use of psychotropic drugs. It's based on patient's choice. It should focus on cooperation with local treatment programs. It should include recovery perspective, it should be network-oriented, should engage families of patients, focus on activity, job, schools, network, help patients to be independent, employ people with own experience. Uh, patients and employees must together develop a program that they can believe in. So that was a, you know, something that the Regional Health Trust told us, that we have to believe in the program and we have to follow national treatment guidelines, which is, has been somewhat challenging because these guidelines are very uh, often very drug-based. But they generally say that you, should, that you should offer drugs, but that you should not force people that don't want drugs to use drugs. So drug-free treatment should be based on the main ideas that the user initiative focused on, and that was that patients uh, shall be, not be subject to any kind of coercion, uh, and the, the most important aspects to the treatment is to provide a safe environment, a bed to sleep in, someone to talk with, and uh, regular meals for every patient. And some people say that, well, this cannot be specialized health care. But, uh, I mean, this is also something that goes on in any kind of ward in the system. <clears throat> well, shall, one sh shall emphasize on the development of a good treatment culture for drug-free treatment that can contribute to development of new medical knowledge, new needed knowledge. And drugs shall not be an important part of the treatment that is offered, but shall not be refused to patients that want drugs. So this was kind of you know, the background for uh, establishing this, and we also got very strict criteria for who we uh, were allowed to admit to this program. I will come back to that because we had some problems in uh, trying to uh, to live up to these uh, different ideas here. So we were supposed to organize this in the midst of a uh, psychiatric institution or in the midst of a division for mental health and substance abuse with the University Hospital of North Norway. And this is the main hub for the uh, psychiatric, uh, for the division of mental health and substance abuse, which is located in Tromsø and now is organized as a part of, a, of the university hospital. It used to be a psychiatric hospital. Uh, so we were supposed to local in the midst of this, and that's been an important part of the uh, of the establishment of this unit uh, altogether because it's been important for us to be a part of the ordinary system. We're not a part of a different system. We're a part of the ordinary system. That seems to be actually uh, very much more provocative to the system than if we had been you know, organized as something else, an alternative somewhere else. Uh, so uh, it's been important to us to be all the time to be a part of this system. And uh, when we tried to develop this, we didn't find any national or international experience with st establishing a drug-free bed unit within the framework of a psychiatric clinic uh, or hospital. Some of you might know of different other options, for instance, the Soteria possibility. But we talked with several places that were uh, uh, that, that call themselves soteria places, and many of them were organized outside, outside of the system. And also there seems to be more use of uh, 
psychotropic drugs in soteria places than we had expected. Uh, so uh, that was, we didn't really find any international experience with this, and we also looked for very many different uh, measures that were, you know, uh, that could be used, and that it was very difficult to find any uh, measures for treatment without drugs that were really, uh, that, were, that were very clear and that were very, uh, what should I say, evidence-based, uh, because most of the, all these uh, programs that have been tried out uh, uh, in addition, were programs that were tried out in addition to drugs, not, not as an alternative to drugs. So, six beds in the midst of a hospital, a catchment area, big catchment area, a very big area altogether. Uh, so we early on decided that we cannot have long-term stay in these six beds that will make it impossible for us to give this offer to very many people. So, uh, as a result of this, when we planned, we, try, we had to think, well, how can we plan this in a way so that we can uh, so that we can give an offer to, to more than six people at a time. When we uh, plan mental health or health care systems in Norway, we very often talk about the treatment chain where the patient is supposed to be, you know, at the very right place in the treatment chain. Uh, and there are very many limitations to this way of thinking or to use this as a metaphor for planning uh, psychiatric health care. Uh, the treatment chain, you, you know, it presupposes well-defined conditions so that you know who should be where in this treatment chain. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult to find things that, uh, you know, uh, can say clearly that you should be at this or this point in this treatment place, in this treatment chain, because uh, there is no general agreement. I mean, the diagnoses are completely uh, uh, unuseful in this perspective. Uh, and... Uh, so that's a problem with the treatment chain, and that undermines responsibility because many patients seem to be in the wrong place. If you ask people, if, for instance, in Norway, in acute wards, if the patients there are at the right place, they would often say that around 40% they're at the wrong place. They should have been somewhere else in the community or some other kind of programs. So it undermines responsibility. It implies idea of hierarchical knowledge. You know, you get the idea that there's more knowledge in the very inst uh, office at the university and a little less knowledge at the regional hospital and even less at the psychiatric center. This is not the kind of uh, a, a good idea with, about knowledge, in my opinion. Knowledge generally is, uh, you know, very local and it is in clinical work, it's very much developed in each case. What kind of knowledge is good in each case is very much developed in each case. Uh, and in uh, this high hierarchical system, you know, knowledge will generally only be, you know, transferred from one, uh, from one part of the chain to another. You will not develop it like you can in other ways of thinking. So it, and also this way of thinking undermines continuity because the patient is just supposed to be at one place at a time. So if you have a lot of problems, you have an outpatient treatment program and you need to go to a hospital, then you will have to change you know, your therapist, you will have to change your milieu altogether. So it's, it's, it's a kind of uh, organized discontinuity in the system to have this perspective. So we try to use the treatment web as, a, as another metaphor for for developing the program and in the treatment web, web, it's easier to see that the responsibility is shared. It enhances cooperation. It's more, the, uh, knowledge seems to be more democratic and local knowledge is more focused on and uh, it also emphasizes more continuity, which I will come back to. So we thought of the drug-free treatment unit as a new possibility in the mental health treatment web. So if you're, a, for instance, a person in a, in a community, this is a round person in the community, and you have serious problems of uh, serious mental problems of one kind or another. You would generally get some kind of treatment office offer at the local psychiatric center, and uh, if you decide together with the local psychiatric center that you need that you would like to try the option of drug-free treatment, then he will refer, or she will refer you to the. the uh, drug-free treatment unit, and you, the drug-free treatment unit would generally also ask you to send your own referral. 
And we realize that people in this situation, they will very often have a lot of other connections in their lives. And uh, uh, what we would call, you know, their private and their professional network. It will differ, but in this case, for instance, the general practitioner, uh, home services, uh, work, family, friends. <clears throat> and this, this network will sometimes have some kind of connections and know one another. But when we meet with people, we would generally try to establish a network perspective on the treatment. So we will try to connect this very concretely. By when, so when a person is referred to the unit, we will generally say, well, who should we bring in to a conversation about the possibility of a drug-free treatment program? And then we would t uh, have those that, you know, the, the person and the referring person think is a good idea to bring into that, and we will have a conversation or a web-oriented first meeting. This, so this is what we would call then the treatment web. Uh, so in the net, with working with this web or network perspective, we draw a lot on the uh, Tom Anderson working with reflecting processes and open dialogue with Jaco Saikola. Tom Anderson was, a, was from Tromsø and, and worked in Tromsø with us for a long time. Uh, and uh, so this is some of the knowledge that we draw heavily on when we think about working with the network. So, we have a network-oriented referral process where we have a written referral from the service system and patients and we meet with everyone that, uh, uh, that it, it's acceptable to meet with. It will differ a little and uh, the patient is the one that decides who should be included in a network meeting. And we would generally ask these very simple questions in the first meeting. What's the history of the, of the idea of this meeting? Because then we will know who thinks this is a good idea? Who thinks this is a bad idea? Who is, you know, really going for this? And, who's, uh, and what is the opposition in this? And, and we will also uh, spend some time in discussing how should you organize this meeting? According to our experience, it will very often be a good idea to have some people in a, what we call a reflecting position that can reflect on what goes on in this uh, conversation after the, or in this meeting, after the meeting has gone on for a while. And uh, we will also uh, emphasize a lot on the possibility that everyone should be able to bring in their themes. So this must also be addressed in the beginning of such a meeting. And for us it's of course very important to know what place the drug-free treatment unit should have in this treatment program. So by saying all this, I'm saying that we are really organizing a treatment program which is not only linked to the beds, but which is a treatment program that goes on when the patient is in the unit and when the patient also is at home. So we have a, we have a web oriented conversations throughout the treatment, the time when the patient is in contact with the drug free treatment unit. And the, the role of the treatment unit will also will will be to have to organize these network meetings. That will be one important part of the role of the drug-free treatment unit. In addition, uh, we will have a, so, so we will have a role in the overall planning of the drug-free treatment program. And then we also, of course, will organize what goes on when the patient is in the ward. We uh, think that, you know, most people should live most of their lives at home. And we try not to take over from being a home for patients like so many psychiatric institutions traditionally have done. So the stays will generally be rather short and a lot of what goes on in the program will go on in cooperation with the local psychiatric center when the patient is at home. Uh, so this is, that's the central part of the, of the program. The patient will generally stay you know, for one to three weeks, three to four times a year, depending on how long the patient will be will engage with the drug-free treatment unit. Uh, and we will also spend time in the unit uh, with the individual programs. In addition, the patient is expected to take part in the organized program that goes on in the unit while the patient is in there. And also the drug-free treatment unit will have some uh, individual following up between admittances to, the, to this unit. <coughs> so in addition to, uh, to uh, 
the network perspective, the recovery perspective is very central, and there are some traits to this, and uh, people uh, understand recovery differently. We, we have tried to have this, uh, 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 I, I mean, this is partly what we can think about when we think about uh, um, recovery, and we try or tend to bring those ideas with us uh, in all parts of the or what goes on within the, uh, the drug-free treatment ward when the patients are there. And also, uh, uh, as a part of the recovery work, we have a daily recovery workshop for one hour a day uh, for patients and uh, some employees in the unit where we will have different themes uh, on a weekly basis. This was originally somewhat inspired by the American system IMR, which some of you might be familiar with, but we kind of took off from that because it's, that seems to us to be too much based on uh, compliance with drug use. So, uh, so there is this program that's on a daily basis. In addition to that, uh, we also uh, have physical exercise as a big part of the program. Uh, which we think, think is very important, and which seems to be important for patients uh, also to be able to continue with some kind of physical program when they're at home, when they're not in the unit. So the unit was, in this respect, and also in many other respects, rep represents some kind of boosting possibility for patients uh, that they are boosted to, you know, uh, to, to this when they're in the ward. We also have art therapy, both uh, in groups and individuals. So there are, this is, you know, the main basis for the program in the ward, in addition to what I said earlier, that there's a, an individualized program when it comes to tapering, when it comes to crisis plans and different other things when the patients are in the ward. So we have met some challenges, especially with the criteria for admitting patients, like I said earlier. And one of these challenges is, of course, that no coercion is a, is a rule for us. And it's a rule in Norway that you cannot have voluntary psychiatric treatment in Norway if you're not able to have what we call the capacity to consent. So you need to have the capacity to consent to be able to have voluntary psychiatric treatment. And uh, of course, capacity to consent doesn't only mean that you agree with the psychiatrist and everything. It has these criteria, but they're evaluated by psychiatrists. So it's a, it's a challenging thing that you have to be, especially if the capacity to consent seems to change during the stay in the ward. Uh, we also, of course, have the, we have the possibility of psychiatric advanced directives, uh, which means that you know you plan what's going to happen to you <coughs> when you don't have the capacity to consent in a situation where you have the capacity to consent. But in Norway, these are not legally binding uh, things. Uh, I mean, these are not legally binding the uh, uh, advanced directives that you give. We should also give priority to patients with psychosis, and we have a lot of patients that don't want their problems to be classified in this way. Uh, and we have decided, well, it really doesn't matter. We don't pay much attention to, to diagnosis at all. We try to say, we say that patients that have been subject to uh, psychotropic drugs, especially neuroleptics, they are uh, a part of, they're, uh, you know, there's, there could be a reason for them to come to us, whatever the diagnosis is. <clears throat> referral only for, from specialized services, that is also a problem, you know. Uh, some people don't have a good relationship with local specialized services. <clears throat> some local specialized services don't believe in us and don't want to refer anyone to us, so there are different reasons why that also is a problem. So we also then accept referrals from others, although we're not supposed to, when, it, when we think it's necessary. And no acute admissions, and some users will say, well, that's when it's mostly needed. And we have, uh, you know, we give acute, the possibility of acute admissions to patients that are uh, in our program. So the people that we know, they might also come between planned stays when we have, the when we have room for them. Uh, and they, uh, so that's a possibility in more acute situations. Uh, only safe therapeutic procedures. Uh, 
it's always difficult to say in psychiatry what is a safe procedure. Are drugs safe procedures? Some would say they're not. I mean, it's, it's a difficult question, and of course we have to think about that, but uh, we generally will try to comply with what people want. And uh, tapering of psychotropic drugs prior to admission, that has been completely impossible for us. <clears throat> so that's uh, actually it's been an important part of our work is to help people taper neuroleptics, which is a, which is a big challenge for many people. But we have, uh, <clears throat> we use, that's a theme in the, in the referral process, and it's a theme in the recovery workshops, and we make individual plans together with many patients on, about this, where we have to take many things into consideration, and uh, uh, yeah, so we have, uh, uh, but many people, I, I think, have uh, the experience of tapering is generally good. People are uh, report more positive experiences than negative experiences from tapering psychotropic drugs, and especially neuroleptics. <clears throat> and we have used these uh, things because there's not much scientific knowledge about how to taper. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, so we use these, and we also then focus maybe more than many others on, <clears throat> um, you know, tapering is not only something that goes on within the body, it goes on within the family, it goes on within your network. So tapering, is, we try to think of tapering in a more wide perspective. Um, so, and there's also been a question, you know, is drug-free treatment in line with good practice? And uh, uh, so this is what the government has said about that. Uh, that is, the, a professional acts in line with good practice if the patient is offered medication in accordance with treatment guidelines but refuses. This given that the patient is considered to have the capacity con to consent. I would say that this shows that, you know, the Norwegian health authorities really don't believe all that strongly in the drug-free treatment program. And we don't ask the patients if they want drugs because they have all always been offered drugs several times earlier. It's not possible in Norway to get serious mental problems and not be offered drugs. It, that's our experience. 95% of the patients that have come to us have experiences with using neuroleptics. So what have we achieved? I think we, you know, the mental health has been put on the agenda. We, there's been a big debate in Norway around this offer since we started. These are, you know, four different professors that's uh, before we started or around the time when we started uh, <coughs> came out very much against us. And this resulted in, of course, discussions. We had this article in the journal Psychopharmacology where a uh, bunch of psychiatrists at the university, at the hospital in southern Norway interviewed one another and decided that this is a qualitative project and none of us would do anything like drug-free treatment because that's not uh, in line with good practice. <clears throat> so, and it, here's the chairman of the Norwegian Psychiatric Association saying that when there are lack of resources in mental health, it's uh, very bad that we should use some of them for drug free treatment programs. And I think still that we are under some kind of threat when it comes to this program. So all these different articles, they uh, makes us, you know, it makes it possible for us to take part in different discussions, which are taking place in Norway, I think, almost all the time. So uh, also different sides of the use of neuroleptics have been highlighted. I think some of these ideas have been uh, pointed that earlier today, but there are very many, I would say, myths that there's a reason to put the question mark on the back of, and uh, we are trying to do that, and we discuss this within our hospital and also in other places. And also the use of diagnosis, which you have heard about earlier today, uh, the diagnosis in psychiatry, you know, they're generally not uh, medical diagnosis, they're just a classificatory system, and uh, they are, uh, I don't think they have, they have give us much help. And uh, I, I will not say much more about that, but some patients with us have received treatment more in line with their wishes, and there are, some of you speak French, there's made a French television program where some patients talk, and there's a 
program on BBC where there's a, a woman that talks quite a bit about us and there's a Norwegian program where, you know, so that you can find different things. And we also have research underway uh, where we are trying to, uh, which is a qualitative project. It's taken some time before we got it launched because very many people wanted us to have more of a quantitative project, which is very difficult in a situation where people so much define themselves, uh, what they want, and where the program is very much individually tailored to each person. Uh, and it's also very difficult to say what's the end point here. We have some patients that have had a very good, you know, two years after they stayed with us, they're very satisfied. Four years after, they're not that satisfied. Well, what's the end point here? It's difficult to say. So, <clears throat> so when you ask patients and people working with us what's different from other hospital wards, well, it's the web perspective. Focus on wellness and health, not illness and pathology. Tapering plans for drugs in use. The goal not to offer neuroleptics, but to help to struggle together with patients. The combination of treatment possibilities and patients may choose to write their own records. I didn't say much about that, but that's a part of us. We try to, to, uh, to help patients be empowered, so to speak. So I think in Norway, there are two directions for mental health, like there are many other places, and I think uh, I think these are both working at the same time, and I don't think it's possible really to unify these uh, two positions. Uh, but it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to see how this struggle will work out. I would like to end by quoting a dear colleague of mine, Gianfranco Cecchini. He was one of the uh, creators of the Milan approach to family therapy. And on a, in a conference on Balkan in 2001, he said that we must constantly fight against regimes of oppression. And I think in this day's world, this is more important than ever. And he said, what characterizes regimes of oppression? Obedience, silence, the idea that differences are dangerous, authorities, medication, instructions, expert knowledge, centralizing, and consensus. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Magnus, for this uh, very interesting talk. This uh, humane, inclusive, and respectful, respectful approach is very interesting, and no doubt many questions. So please raise hands, as Magnus will take some questions. Magnus Halt. No uh, surprise for us that uh, you give such an excellent uh, lecture. It, it just your name, Magnus Halt. In Icelandic, there is a Halt, Halt i Magnusi. <laughs> and uh, I ex think I explained to you yesterday. But, uh, I would like to, to have you comment on the role of self-help groups. For me, as a bipolar person with a, a lot of experience of, uh, of uh, this uh, psychiatry and what it involves for us often, uh, coercion and unnecessary violence, uh, the greatest help for me to uh, stay alive and to survive the psychiatry has been the self-help groups. And actually, uh, I've been on free food now for over 36 years, which uh, I thank uh, the self-help groups you talked about sharing experiences in the treatment, but uh, yesterday it was mentioned, uh, someone mentioned, it was Chris maybe or someone else who, in, the, in the peers' uh, support mentioned the history of AA. Uh, we have, uh, it's a strong movement in Iceland, it has helped me a lot for over 36 years to stay sober, 
and uh, we have had a group, self-help group uh, for bipolar people uh, for nearly 24 years now. In October it will be 24 years. Uh, what is your experience and your opinion with this, on this? Well, personally, I don't have very much experience with self-help groups. Uh, the, the program when patients are in the ward at the drug-free treatment unit is very group-based and have some traits that you can recognize from, I think, self-help group, like uh, recovery workshop, uh, uh, and all these and uh, physical training, uh, <clears throat> art therapy, and they all uh, they all happen in groups where both uh, patients and uh, employees participate. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that's generally a very good experience in the inpatient situation. When it comes to self-help group outside, there are some self-help group organized in. The bigger cities, or bigger or bigger, I mean the cities that we have in northern Norway, but very many people live in very uh, isolated areas where it's difficult, you know, really to get a group together. So that's one of the problems with that, I think. But there are some self-help groups that are organized on the uh, local level, but I don't have personally much experiences with that. We, we also have uh, on the web, uh, we have on the Facebook groups with several hundreds of people who share their experiences, strengths, and, uh, and, and uh, on the net, which in a way uh, serves the same purpose, even not fully. Yeah. I think that's also, of course, a possibility, although there are <clears throat> clear limits to what can we tried for a period we tried to include uh, patients that were not in the ward in the group activity in the ward but that was very difficult because they they were in such a very different position so I think there are some limitations to what you can do on the net compared to what you can do when you meet face to face First of all, thank you very much for uh, a very interesting lecture. Um, there's a lot of, lot of things you uh, uh, mentioned, um, and it's a lot to take in. Uh, will there be a possibility of accessing, for instance, uh, the slides or, or something online that one can review more? Because this is something that I'm very deeply interested in and, and, and wish to learn more about. Um, as, a, as a person with uh, diagnosed bipolar that may be misdiagnosed mm. and so forth, um, this is something that really affects me. So, so will that be possible to, to access? Of course, yes. I will give them to Grimur and he can send them to everyone. That thank you. And thank you very much again for your lecture and your time. Do we have any others? Yes. Morning. I was wondering, where have there been any instances where a decision was made to resort to medications? And what were the reasons behind it? And was there consent? If there were any instances where we had to use medication? Yes. That's what, that's what you At asked. some point during the stay at the medication-free well, <clears throat> department. Generally, we... We put a great emphasis on people being able to take responsibility for themselves. And we have to believe that, and we have been better in doing that. We were kind of, I think in the beginning, we were more scared. Uh, but it seems that people that are being respected, and when we tell them that we want to, we want to help you whatever way we can, but we can't control you. We can just help you. So tell us what we can do to help you. And we have had uh, a couple of patients that have asked for medication and that have gotten medication because they asked for it. But that's not very many. And we have also had a couple of cases where, we, where the patient <clears throat> lost their capacity to consent to such a degree that they couldn't stay in the ward anymore. Uh, we had to, you know, uh, to, we had to say that you can't stay in the ward. 
And in one of those cases, which is a few years ago, the patient was admitted, was coerced to stay in a in a acute ward. The other case, the other patient himself, he chose to stay in a different ward, but he couldn't stay with us because he was not able to comply to the you know he wasn't he wasn't able not to break things and to so it was very very difficult situation. We had situations like that. So this is very rare then that yeah, somebody it's very is rare. yeah okay thank you. I think we have room for at least one more question. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, don't have a question. I have a, uh, a comment to make. First of all, congratulations. I think it's a very important step to offer this opportunity to patients to, to uh, try out drug-free free treatments. Uh, but I want to tell you that, that uh, there are uh, uh, there have been written many papers about uh, drug-free treatment. But for example, I uh, worked in the States we did my training and then uh, uh, stayed another three years and I worked on a unit at the New York Hospital which was uh, drug free for people with psychosis. And, uh, and there are many other clinics in the States which were doing the same thing, Austin Riggs, managers and, and other clinics. Uh, and it, uh, it really wasn't uh, drug free but it was kind of a minimal use of medications like you are doing actually. But I wanted to, to share with you an experience we had when people really were going through a very difficult time uh, and had to be somehow uh, contained. Uh, that instead of medications, they were sometimes offered cold wet packs. Cold. This may sound very, cold wet packs. Okay. This may sound very strange to you and to everybody else, but let me describe it to you. And this is an old treatment was used in the 18th and 19th century also. Uh, uh, that uh, the patient was uh, in a special room. He was lying on a bed, uh, and uh, seats were was ice cold, wet seats. He was wrapped in those seats and would stay there, and they would periodically be cooled down. Uh, and this was with the patient's consent, and the experience was very good because it, this was soothing. Uh, somebody sat by the patient's side and was nearby for contact, and this would take perhaps two, three hours, but, uh, but uh, 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 it worked. Uh, it took some time, of course, but uh, uh, afterwards the patients, they felt were good about this. It was kind of both soothing and confirming, even kind of physical eco boundaries by the, by the <coughs> contact with the seats. So this is something what you might try up in cold North Norway also. Actually, we have a, a you know in the in the f physical exercise program we have a weekly swimming in the ocean year round, <coughs> which is uh, m might be something similar. <laughs> One short question. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask. What is the first step to how to organize a medical free unit? What, what did you say? The first step would be to do first. The first step is to, you know, to have the regulation resources and possibility. So then to get, the, to get this idea through to those that are uh, providing resources and money. And to do that, I think user organizations have to be united. Okay, thank you very much. And let's thank Magnus for his wonderful talk.